for us. Thank you. And okay. So we are going to go over how to use the back office and we'll go through the work order creation to completion process as well. And I'll show you um, some of, we'll probably flip over to just the vendor side for connected vendors so we can see work orders moving in real time when we talk about those work orders as well. All right, so to start off, um, navigation, um, everyone is going to have a login so you'll log in with your username password using the url that you're given i'm in the staging site today so we can create work orders without any uh, without affecting any of your production environment so at the top you'll all you'll see that there's different options and your options and what you have available under those menus will be different based on what your access is and what your role is so you might see less um, less options when I click on some of these tabs. So there's places that are customizable within a system by user. So that means that when you log in, you'll be able to set up some things the way that you want to see them going forward. So one of those is the dashboard. So the dashboard is kind of your a visual indicator of things that are going on and everyone will be able to customize their dashboard for themselves. So when you first log into the system, or if you haven't logged in before and set this up, you're gonna see that the dashboard is empty and there's a plus sign here where you can add your own components. So when I click on the add button, really shouldn't take that long. Sorry about that. Let me make sure I've got a internet connection here. All right, so when I click on the add button, I get a list, a drop down list of the components that are available for me to add to my dashboard. And then I'll be able to kind of customize these components to what I want to see. So um, we have a map component, which will map out where your work orders are, um, emergency work orders component, overdue work orders, just work orders. So we'll start with that one. So I choose the one I want, I click on add. And that's going to add that component to my dashboard. Sorry, I'm just checking to see if I have something else open that's causing my internet to delay. Okay, so add the component. And so this this work order component is going to show me a list um, of the different active work order statuses and how many work orders are in each of those statuses. Each component is going to have a little gear button and this is going to allow us to do some customization of the component so I can title this component to what I'm going to see. Throughout the system you're going to see you'll have selections of portfolios and work zones. Portfolios are groups of work zones, and work zones are your individual locations um, of where work is being done, your customer locations. So if I want to choose a portfolio and I want to say prime, then I can also title my um, component so that it will so I'll know what it's displaying for me. And then I have some views available, so view on the work order list. I'm just going to leave that as the default view. And so there you can see it just changed my new status at less than the amount of work orders that that were showing up there. So that's the work order component. You can have several work order components. So if you want to have one for your different um, portfolios that you have access to, you can create one for each of the different customers, title them however you want. Um, the emergency component and the overdue work orders component, these are a little bit different. These show the number of emergencies or the number of work orders kind of on this scale. So this, you can set this to how you want it to, when you want it to turn red. So number on the dial and how many work orders um, on that dial will turn it red. So we don't have any emergency work orders in there, so it's just showing me there's no emergencies. We have the map. 
So the map component will be added. Um, the first time that you open the map, it's going to ask you to allow your browser to find your location so you can see your location on the map. Um, and then you would just be able to scroll in and out. You can make this um, a large map if you wanted to see a larger view of the map. And there are some settings here for what you can see. So you can see your locations. Then you can add work orders to this. So you'd be able to see different items within the map. So I'm not sure what locations we've got work orders for, but if I were to uh, scroll out here and see, you know, go into one of our areas, I would start to see pins on the map if we have locations that match up with the map. All right, so there's a map view that can help you identify where you've got work orders in certain areas. There's also a component for the PM program. So PM, RM, preventative and repetitive work orders. So if you create um, work orders that are going to generate automatically, there's um, a component here that will show you how you're doing in compliance um, for getting all of those PM type work orders completed. So eventually, we'll probably talk more about that setup um, going forward. Any questions on setting up the dashboard? No. No, thank you. OK. So each of these components that is showing numbers attached to it um, is a click through. So if I were to click on this new work orders for Prime, it is going to send me to a work order list page. And this can also be found under work orders list. So you have the ability to, um, to just go directly there. Now the list view also allows for some customization by user. So because I clicked through um, the dashboard component, it automatically selected my portfolio. And because I clicked on new work orders, it automatically set a status for um, this particular view. And so it filtered my list of work orders to just show me those work orders in new status. If I go to my work order list using the menu option, then that's going to take me into a default view. Sorry about that. I don't know why I'm getting all these errors. I feel like the Microsoft guy who had to download a different browser to uh, do his demo. All right, work order list. Okay, so if I go to work order list, that's gonna take me to a default view um, that will be set up. So, so here I have my default view of things that are set up. So at the top here, I have different filters that are available. And so you'll have a default view that will have these different filters, portfolio, the status of work orders. This happens to be able to show also completed within a certain time frame and a search option. In your list, um, you have different columns that are available. And so you can customize this view to what, um, what works for you. So there's always going to be an action column here. It's going to get you um, into view this particular line. There's these two little um, two little squares here that opens up our dialog, which will allow us to add columns or remove columns. So all these different columns are available to put into our list. So if I wanted to add things like flag and flag reason, 
maybe who the owner of the work order is, which we'll talk about when we start creating work orders. I can add those things into my view so I'd be able to see them. You can also move these columns around. So if I click and hold the column and drag it, I can move them so they're in an order that makes sense for me. So if I want to see my flag and my flag reason all the way over to the left, I can do that. So I can move these around however I want. Um, I can also then change my filters. So maybe I don't care about having completed, canceled with a time frame. There's additional filters here though. So maybe I want to add an owner filter. Owner is going to be the person on your team who is going to be working on the work order. So maybe I just want to be able to search and by owner and see everything that's assigned to a particular owner. So once I have a view that I have set up that I like, I can actually save that view so that I can go back to it and not have to make changes to it. The system will remember, um, like if I were to log out and log back in, it'll take me back to this view, how I have it set up. But if I make any changes to it, I would lose this view. So up at the top here, you have the drop down and the ability to actually save your view. So a sysadmin can create global views. So if there are views that, um, that the sysadmin team thinks will be helpful for everyone or wants to put out there to have everyone ha use as a starting point, then those are global views that can be managed. So you might not see that option. But you, should, you will see Save View As. And so here I can go and save my current view as a new view. And so I can give it a title. So you'd want to title your view. For training, I'm just putting my name on them so I know that I created them. But for your views, they're all going to be personal views for your login. And so you'll probably want the view to describe what kind of view it is. So like this one I'm putting, this will show me with the owner. Or if I create a work order view for completed work orders, I might create a completed work order view. So once I name it, I'll click the checkbox. And then it will save my view. And so then I'll have all my different views saved in the list. So if I move back and forth between them, you can see that my views change based on what I select. All right. So then down at the bottom of the screen, um, this displays 250 lines at a time up to you, so you can set that to whatever you want. It tells you how many pages you'll have, and there's navigation buttons down on the bottom left to go from page to page if you have more than 250 lines. So you'll be able to, um, to see that. You can also click on a column header, and it will sort by that column ascending or descending order for you. So you can do that as well. The bottom left, there's a mass manage option. And so this will allow you to take actions against various, more than one work order at a time, different actions you'll take. And those will make more sense as we go through the work order process. So any questions about creating a view or using this view screen? No. Um... I want to ask a question, but if, it, if the answer is going to take us off in a direction too far, just let me know and I can wait. Where do we go to set the global view? The same place. So if you have that those rights as a sysadmin, you would just come to this work order list and you would be able to save when you do manage global views, add okay. current view, and then you would title it. And once you've saved it, then it would be available to everyone who logs in. So you do it right from here. The okay, same perfect. Way. Thank you. All right. So up at the top here, there's a couple of options. You might not have the import option. That's a sysadmin option, but there is an option to export to Excel. So for any reason you needed a copy of this um, list in an Excel format, maybe to parse out some follow-up work or to send something off to a vendor for them to follow up. 
I can send this um, list view that I've created. It'll take all of the work orders. So even if I've got a thousand work orders here, it's only displaying the first 250. Whatever is in my view will export to Excel with all these columns that I've added to my list view. So you can use that for, um, you know, if you needed to, if you needed to manipulate those lists in any way or parse them out or something. The plus sign is going to be how we're going to create a new work order from this screen. There's a couple of different ways to create a work order. So before we talk about um, that, I'm just going to go over and talk about jobs. So jobs and spaces, these are our actual customer locations. And so when I go to jobs and spaces, I'll get a similar list. This work, these list views, they're in several different places and they all work the same. So I have the ability to add filters, add columns that I want. Um, the columns change based on what section you're in, what you can apply. You can set up views on these different screens. So if you have a particular view that you want to, you know, want to add maybe so you can get to one particular customer at a time or something, then you could certainly you know, create a view for that. And then um, you also have some mass manage functions that'll be based on your role, what you can do. So from here, this is where I can see some details. So each location, each customer location has a job record, okay? And it's tied to an account for that particular customer. And so when I click on the job, that's gonna take us into the job details. And this is where I can see a little bit more information. Um, the space, that's the actual location that we're servicing. This will also show us some work order history. So all the work orders that we've done against this location, it's also going to have contacts. So it's my understanding at this time, you guys will be getting an email notification that you've got a new service request from your customer. And so if you needed to go into the system and get a phone number to contact them, sorry, sorry. or you needed to um, see the work order history, you wanted to check that out before you put in a service request or any other information that is um, available here, then you can always go into the job record and then you have create a new service request from here. So. Creating a new service request is always going to start with selecting the customer location that we're doing the job at. It's just a matter of how are you going to select that. So you can start from within the job record. If there's additional details, like things we can see, they've got you know, 14 active work orders, 13 of them are overdue. If there's any notes that have been added into their record, that notes here is referring to things that were created in the job record that don't, didn't involve a, a work order. So you, you'll have access to all this information. So you can come here first, find the job, and then create the service request, or you can start from the work order list page and click the plus sign and find the, um, and start the service request. Okay, so like I said, there's a notes section here. If you're working on something that's not work order related, but it has to do with this customer or the location and you want to record it as a note in the job record, you can add a note here. You also have the ability to say whether that issue has been resolved or not. So this might be, um, you know, maybe you're helping them get in touch with someone or something not related to a work order that you're gonna end up billing them for, or maybe you need to add a note about some information regarding this particular property. You can put those, um, those notes in here. There's also a place for special instructions in each job record. And so this can be used to store if there's information that you want someone to be aware of every time that they're creating a work order, or if there's um, instruction on like how to access the roof or you know, the hot water heater room, um, you can put in special instructions that will show up when you select the customer record. We also have a place to store documents for, and this is customer related documents. So if there's a contract or something that you wanted to store with the record, you can do that. 
And then there's other options here that we haven't talked about setting up or using yet. So that's why I'm skipping um, actually talking about them. We do have some custom fields um, that we might be using to store information related to our integrations that we're working on. All right, so let's go through the, any questions about the job record? Okay. No? No, we're good. No, we're good. All right, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and start a service request. So I'm going to go back to the work order list and we'll start a request from there. So I'm going to click on the plus sign. And so when I go to create a work order, it's going to ask me to select the space. So I basically get a list of all of my customer records that are in the system. And then I have my, my portfolio selector here. And I could also type if I know a piece of information about that particular location, like the address or the location number, then I can type that in, do a search so that I'll be able to attach this to a customer record. So once I found my record, I'm gonna click on the arrow, select and continue. And then this will take me to um, enter the contact. So this also shows me work order history. So if I wanted to see what other work orders, just make sure that I'm not creating a duplicate, you know, based on the email that I've received, I can come in and see all of these work orders and what their status is. So I see them if they're in, in progress. Yes. Does that view just show current ones or also the history or the closed ones? This should is that just going to show what's open? Go ahead. No, this would show us all of our. This should show us all of our work orders for this location. We do have completed all the look. Okay, thank you. So if I wanted to see, you know, one of these work orders, if I click on it, it will open that work order detail in a separate window for me. So I can go and check and make sure I'm not, you know, creating a duplicate work order. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is type in as a contact, I'm putting in my name and we'll see that this, you're gonna see this as the default, enter CSC name. And so this is where we're going to enter, um, I believe you guys are gonna enter whoever's going to be working on this ticket as the contact name. That's correct, yeah. So I'm going to be working on it and my phone number there is that. So I'm gonna put my information in here because when I send this work order off to a vendor, I wanna be the one that the vendor um, contacts. So then I'm gonna click on next. And so now I'm gonna get a list of all the items that I can choose for repairs. So I'll be looking at the email, they're asking me to do some flooring repairs. So I can come and look at the list. I can either type in up at the top. You know, I have some tile that needs to be repaired. And so anything with tile will show up. So here I can select tile and it will take me down and show me that that's under flooring repairs. Or I can open up each item by using the arrows and it'll show me all the items underneath that. Okay, so once I've selected an item, so here tile actually has something underneath of it. So it has base ceramic or vinyl. So if we know down to that detail, we can put that in. So then once I've chosen an item, you're gonna see if there's any active work orders on that item and if there's any warranties that have been put in on that item. And so you'd be able to see, you know, if I have active work orders, that means something not complete. If I'm putting in a new work order on that item, I probably want to check the active work order because I don't want to create a duplicate work order if we're already doing something. So then I'll choose um, the task. So this is what type of repair is being requested. So you're, you're going to see a lot of generic tasks. So I'm going to choose repair and then I'm going to type in a description of what work needs to be done. So I would type in my description of the work based on what the email was that I received. And so then I'll click on next. And so here, 
um, this is going to just give me a chance to review and confirm what I've already put in and create the actual work order. So I'm just checking my um, that I have put in, put this against the correct location. It's going to show me as the owner of the work order because I have, um, I'm the one creating it, then it's gonna show me the scheduling. So this has come up Kristen? as, yes. Uh, just real quick, I know you're about to show the priority. Um, just kind of show which of these uh, fields, if uh, the customer was logged into their panel or you know exactly what they would see on their side. So if the customer was using the portal, their name what is- they would see. Oh, so they would see, they would be selecting their asset and ta task. So they're gonna see um, what priority has been assigned to the work order. They'll know which one of us is working on it, correct? Yes, because you guys will end up being, um, listed in there as the, as, well, I don't know that we're gonna display that on the portal, who's gonna who's going to be working on it, other than when you guys add notes, they might not see that. Okay, that's fine, go ahead. All right, so the system, based on the asset and task, the system assigned to the priority, and based on the priority, it then assigns these different, um, when we expect this work to be completed by, so the due by date of the work order. So if for any reason I needed to edit that, so if I needed to change the priority, emergency regular, or change when I want this work order to be completed by, then I could make those changes before I create the work order. So once I've got all of that, I'm gonna create, and that's basically going to give me my work order number. So it's also, there's some custom fields that come up. So we're gonna type in requester, so this is actually the person who gave us the work order, who sent the email. And if they have a reference number for their work order number, then we'll type that in and save that. All right, so now I've got the work order created. You can see the work order number comes up at the top. And so this is the quick view of the work order. So if I were to click on any one of these work orders in the list, this is the view that I'm going to get. At the top of this window, it tells me kind of the next action or a tip regarding um, this work order. So it's telling me that the work order needs to be assigned before it can be worked on. And so as the service manager, I can come in and I can assign it. So here we see we have a list of menu options. So different things that we can do, edit the details, assign it, edit the schedule, set a flag, messages, notes, we'll talk about those things. Um, but the first step I'm gonna do as service manager is actually assign it to whoever's going to work on it on my team. So when I come in to assign, and I could have done that before I hit the create button, so it would have already been done as one step, but you don't necessarily have to do that. So when I go to assign, it's gonna default me to all the users on my team. And so I would be able to find who I want in the list and I could search my favorite person to pick on. So I'm going to go ahead and reassign this work order to Jason. Thank you so very much, can... Chris. I appreciate it. <laughs> so you can start working on this. So it tells you up at the top that when I click on save, this is gonna get assigned to Jason. All right, you can see that there's an activity log, so all the different actions that we're taking when we create the work order, change assignments, update things like the schedule or the priority, those types of things are all gonna be logged with a date, time, name stamp in the activity log. So from here, we can see that the option changed here, the next option now is to pick up, so the system is gonna kind of show you what the next step is. So at this point, we've entered the work order and we've assigned it to the person on our team who's going to work on it. And so that pretty much ends the role of the service manager, right, for creating a new work order. Are there questions about that process? 
Can you just show them real quick about the time and the assignment time and the response time, that part of it? The low emergency and that part? What the priority? Or better off once we go on the ticket? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the priorities are, how they're set up? Well, <clears throat> it may be better on the other screen. I just want to make sure they understand that the you're given the sub X amount of time to respond. And then yeah, the scheduling, Kristen. Okay, so I'm going to click on View Details. And that's going to take me into all of the details of the work order. So up at the top, we'll see our work order number. We're going to see our status, top left. We see all the location information. And then at the, t at the top right, we have our drop down for all the different actions that we can take on the work order. Okay, so one of the first things, so now I'm going to take the role of Jason. Okay, so Jason's now getting this work order. So he's going to want to come in and make himself the owner of the work order. So if I come in and edit the details, I can come in and I'm going to take care of this. So I'm going to set myself as the owner. So Jason's the owner. His name, if I already knew, you know, I put in that Kristen was going to be it, but I'm not in your list. So we could edit this as well if we needed to. Um, edit the contact. So we could change this to Jason and put his phone number in there. So he's going to show up as the contact for the work order. So what Jason's going to do is he's going to be reviewing what is the task that needs to be done. And then he's going to be assigning it to assigning this to a vendor. Okay, so here in the scheduling section, let's open up that schedule again. So there's a couple different, um, couple different scheduling details. So, and these are all set up and defaulted based on the priorities. So there's acknowledge by, on site by, and do by. So acknowledge by is the time by which we expect the vendor to, that we send the work order to, to accept the work or pick it up. Um, so that's how much time that they have to, to do that once I send it to them. Then on site is when we expect them to actually be on site for this work order. And do by would be when we expect them to mark this work order as completed um, or complete the job by. Okay. And so those were all based on when I created the work order and what priority. And however, we've got those time frames set, the system automatically calculates those for you. So if I was to change this to a regular request, I can come in and refresh all of these options and it should reset for me based on the priority. So those are the scheduling options. I might not have that turned on in your side to be able to do that actually. So these would refresh the times or regular and low might be almost the same in here. If I wanted to change them manually, I can do that. So if I need this work order to be completed by tomorrow, then I can change that and I can update that due by date. So I wanna do that before I send this to the vendor. Okay, so work order details is also going to show a map of the location if the system was able to map the address. Um, work description is here, so this is what's being worked on. So I can see that. Scheduling an assignment, this is where we're going to change who's assigned to, but you have the activity log. So this is all the actions happening on the work order. We have a notes section, so you can add notes to this work order. Um, as you're working on it. So if you needed to call the customer to get clarification on what they needed to do or what they needed you to have done, then I could add a note onto this work order. So when I type in my note, I can choose to make my note public. And if I choose to make it public, then that means that it would display on the customer portal if this is a customer who has access to your system. So it defaults to make all the notes private um, and you have to actually say if you want something to be public. So you can just type in your notes and save them, and then they're going to show up in the notes section. Are those notes, is that public to the client or just and the subcontractor, or is that public just, just 
or just the client? Public, just to the customer on the portal. Um, anytime you're going to communicate with the vendor, you're going to be sending them a message. Okay. So then there's a financial section. And this is going to be where we have an NTE for the vendor. So when we decide to send the send the work order to the vendor, if we're if we know what we're going to set as their NTE, that's where we'll find that section. Um, we have a punch list section. I'm not sure that we've discussed using any of those. There's a completion and verification section on the work order. So we'll talk about that during the completion process. Here's work order custom fields. So this is where I put in who the requester was and what their reference number was. If there's any custom fields set up at this particular job record, then I'd be able to see those as well. Equipment worked on, we're not using. There's a to-do list. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Vendor quote section. So if we send this to a connected vendor and they submit us a quote, we'll be able to see that in the system. Um, estimates. We haven't talked. We haven't decided how we're if we're going to use estimates or proposals yet. So I'm just going to skip that. You have a document section. So if you send this to a connected vendor and they attach any pictures or other documents, they'll show up in this section. And vendors who are checking in and out um, on their work orders, you'll see those logs here. So you can see how much time they've recorded on the work orders if they're doing that. You can also add documents. So you'll be able to see at every section. If you have rights to do something in that section, you'll see either an edit or an add or some other option to be able to, um, to do something in that field. Okay, so Jason. Chris, I have a question yeah. about the documents. Yeah. Um, if I add a document, <clears throat> am I, this may be just thinking about it too much, but if I add a document, can the vendor see the documents that I, that I add? Um, we have there's a setting that's a global setting that we can turn on so that automatically documents get shared with the work order that's been sent to a vendor. What's the default? What's the default setting on that? No. <laughs> okay. So I don't and know if we I don't know setting? that we turn that on or not. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we have. Um, is it something that we can turn on and turn off, or something? well, so yes, it is a it's a setting within the setting the admin settings that you can turn on. It's global though, so once you turn it on, that means future work orders those documents will get shared. But if you want to leave it off, then you would be able to um, use the print option um, to be able to possible to email or send actually I think message you can do attach documents so send a message I could send this message to the vendor and I can choose which documents I want to attach so I would be able to send them to the all right let me give you this scenario so I receive a proposal an estimate from an electrician uh, I take his information combined with other information I know about the job that I'm doing and other vendors. I put together a turnkey quote to present to a client, and I want to upload that quote to this work order just to you know keep it in one place. Uh, by default settings, they will not be able to see that, correct? Right. Or, pictures. or any pictures, anything that I upload. Right. Okay, just want to make sure. And uh, next question, for all the pictures they send, we, we may have covered this, I, I can't recall or not. Is there a way, of, so if my electrician uploads 20 pictures, is there a feature somewhere where I can just click one button and download everything at one time? Or do I have to go to each one individually and save them? You'd have to go to each one individually to save them currently. I, I have submitted a request on behalf of another customer to make that <clears throat> viewing a better option. We're actually doing some yeah, changes. Yeah, we're actually doing some changes to documents, so that might um, affect us in a future release, how documents are, are managed. But my suggestion to the other customer was when you do that message feature, you would have a list of all the pictures, and you could just say, you know, attach all my documents, send this to any email address, 
so I can send this to email myself. Itself. And then you can, from your email, you can usually uh, yeah. save multiple attachments at once. So that is kind okay. of the what I've presented them as an option if they really needed to do that with a bunch of documents to store them someplace else or attach them into a separate email or something. Yeah. Yeah, we have to attach them to a quote, especially. So you you need to pull the pictures off, and it gets time consuming downloading one you know one at a time. Sure. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is um, if I'm going to send this vendor out to repair this um, this tile, the, my NTE is set to zero dollars. So if I send the vendor a work order with a zero dollar NTE. That basically means that they're not going to be able to submit an invoice for anything until that NTE is increased. So I don't know if you guys decided that you're always going to send them at a zero dollar NTE or you're going to adjust that as you create the work orders. I'm not sure if that's still an open item for you guys to decide. I believe we were going to call the Sub, check on the schedule, and then update the NTE based on the trip. Yeah, we're going to make it a phone call before we send the schedule and the okay. NTE email. <clears throat> okay, so then I would come in here and I would decide who I'm going to assign. So I'm going to edit my assignment. And so now I can go to my vendor list. And so we're in the stage site, so I've only got a couple of vendors that we've got connected, but you have some search options here. So we'll be we'll connect the vendor will connect the specialties in the live site. I think this is missing, but so you're not really seeing this when you do that, but I'll get those connected. Um, but you'd be able to choose a specialty and this is only going, to, so there's two types of vendors in the system. So you have vendors who are connected. So that means that they'll receive everything electronically and be able to communicate with you electronically on that work order. Once you send them the work order, they'd be responsible for doing the updates as far as accepting that work order and then marking it completed. And then we have vendors who are not connected. So for whatever reason, they have not connected to the system, you might still need to use them for a job. And so if they're not connected, then we have only basic information, like their contact information and maybe their zip code put in, but we don't know what services they perform. So if I try to filter the list to see them, since we don't have any of that data about them because they're not connected, they might be harder to find when we do a search. So um, the system automatically pulls in the zip code of the service location here. And so it tries to filter and search for vendors based on this information. If I remove the zip code here, I can get a list of all the vendors so I have this all specialties, I remove the zip code, it's gonna give me all vendors that you guys have access to. I could further refine that. So um, if I wanted to search, if I knew the vendor's name that I wanted to use, I could type in their name and I'd be able to get to them. So you can see when I did that search, we have several vendors, you'll be able to see if they're connected or not. So connected vendors means you know, they'll be able to communicate on the work order. If I send it to a non-connected vendor, my process changes a little bit. So we'll start with a connected vendor and then we'll talk about the non-connected um, vendor. We'll create another work order and take it through. So once I find, and this um, little window here also has some, I have pretty much everything selected, but um, you know, if we're not putting warranties in the system, or you don't want to see their score necessarily, um, then you can change what you see. We're also, we've also preloaded some of the COI information. So in the, in the live site, you should see if there's, there's that certificate of insurance, if their insurance information is valid or not. So once I found the vendor that I want to assign this work order to, I can do select. And just like when I assigned it to Jason, it tells me now when I save, it's gonna reassign this to Kristen's service company. So I click on save and now it's assigned, but the vendor has not gotten anything yet. You'll see the next action is send. So if we're gonna follow that process, so I, I want to send this to Kristen's service company. So I'm gonna give them a call. 
hey, I've got this tile job. I need it done by tomorrow afternoon. Can you get to it? Yes. Do you have any idea of how much it's going to be? Whatever you talk to them about, maybe you decide, okay, I'm going to give, go ahead and give you guys a um, $200 NTE on this. And if it's going to be more than that, when you get there, submit me a quote. So I would come in to edit financial details, and that's where I can update the NTE. So I'm also going to put in a note. Always good to add notes. If it's not in the system, it didn't happen, right? So So I go in, add a note, whatever. If I wanted to make that a public note, I would click that. I click Save. So now I have a note that I spoke to the vendor. I updated the NTE. You can see those things are also in the action log. And then I'm ready to actually send this work order to the vendor. So when I send it, this is actually going to send to the vendor the work order, and then they're going to they'll get the details. So this is a default message that we've configured. Um, on this, it looks it's pulling in your contact information and then this information you can type additional information so when i yeah, spoke to jim so i can type in whatever i want if i want to request a quote from the vendor then i can click this button and what that will do is that'll flag the work order for the vendor telling them they have to submit a quote before they can proceed so they won't be able to take any other action like complete the work order or anything until they've submitted a quote. So once I get, once I have this, if there's nothing for me to add to this, then I could just hit send or I could type in my message. I click send and it's going to go off to the vendor. So because this vendor is connected, um, the vendor is going to get an email advising them that they've got a new work order. And from my point of view, um, I'm pretty much done with this. Now we did talk about using these to-dos in order to create follow-ups on these work orders. So to-dos are actions that you can place on a work order for yourself as a reminder to take some action. Okay, we can, we've talked about with the sysadmin group Talk, talked about setting up some templates so there would be some default options um, when we create a work order. But I can always come in here and um, put in a description. So if I need to follow up on um, completion of the work order, and because I'm the owner or I have Jason assigned as the owner, it automatically puts him as the assigned to. And then I can set when I want this when I want to follow up on this. So I can set it to be the due date um, or a little bit after maybe when this work order was supposed to be due. And so this will create me a to-do list of things that I need to, to take action on. And that's an optional thing from my point of view, but from your guys' point of view, if you want to make that part of your process to fill those in, or if we want to create templates, templates based on the priority of the work order that automatically add some of those in to the work order, we can do that. Okay, so now the vendor gets a message, and let me just show you, under my dashboard, there's also to-dos, and so this is the list of all the to-dos that Jason has not been doing. So we can see this one that I just added. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so here I have, um, this is filtered to show who they're assigned to. So, you know, good old yeah. system admin, yeah. Kristen hasn't been doing hers either, so don't feel bad. So this basically can create a list of to-dos. If you guys are using that, then you as service managers could follow up on your team what they have to follow up on and whether those are getting done. There's also some alerts that can be set and there's also a component on the dashboard that's available as well. Um, you might have seen for my to-dos. 
so I can see if I've got to do's that are overdue. Also, while I'm here, I meant, I'll mention that to do's is important to me. This component is important to me, but I added it last, so it went all the way to the bottom. So I can move this, so it's at the top of my view. So I can move those around a little bit. They're all sized, you know, based on the size of the widget. So certain things will reconfigure accordingly, but I can certainly put that up at the top. Okay, so the vendor got an email. This is an example of the email that Kristen Service Company received, okay? So I got this email, and so as the connected vendor, I'm now going to accept or reject this work order. So since we've already talked to Jim, and he said that you guys, that this Kristen Service Company is gonna be able to do this, then the vendor will accept the work order, okay? So I'm just gonna do it by replying to the email and typing in any comments. So that's an option that the vendors have. So when they connect to the network, they're controlling all of their email information where these emails go to. So then they also have the option to reply back. And when they do that, I'm gonna go back to the work order list and here's that work order that we were just working on. So now we see the status has changed from new to open. And now we see that Kristen's service company is the one who picked it up and accepted it. So any questions about that? Oh, thanks, so. All right. So do you guys want to see the vendor pro the vendor side of the process? What's going to happen now? All right, hang on one second, Chris and Bailey, what's your question? Do you get notified that you get an email or do you have to go to the work order to see that you got an email? Did our agent get a notification via email or they just have to look in their ticket? Yeah, will change. Your, so your service rep will not, will not get notified that it's been picked up. So that was one of the options for to-dos that we have, were talking about that we had set up some examples for, like I could set a to-do to follow up and make sure that got picked up based on when I expected them to. So I would have a reminder to follow up on that. And you'll notice those to-dos also show me the work order. So object is the work order that it's attached to. So I'd be able to see which work order and I could come in here and see, you know, if this, if this to do was to make sure the vendor picked it up, when I click on the work order number, it brings me up the quick view and I get the activity log so I can see that they've done it. So then I could go and mark this to do item completed there. Kristen, isn't there a way, um, does it auto flag when you receive messages inside the work order? Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, so I'm going to just flip over to the vendor system. So this is the system the vendors are using. Um, and so here's that work order that we just sent over for the tile repair. So if I come in and add a message as the vendor, so I add a note. Um, So I want to add a note as the vendor. When I add that, that will create a flag. So if I was looking my flagged work orders, that would become a flagged work order. So if I had on this list my flag and my flag reason, You can see message received is the flag. So it will flag that action. It also flags quotes if for some reason the vendor rejects it. You can also manually add flags to work orders as well. So when I see that the vendor has flagged a work order, I can come up here, I see that it's flagged, I can see their message. Okay, we contacted the store and we'll do this after close tonight. So I can come here and clear the flag if there's no action that I need to take. 
or I can take the action. Maybe the vendor asked me to call them for clarification so I can call them, add a note, and then clear my flag. And so basically this just gives you a pop-up that says, hey, you really wanna clear this flag? And so when I say, okay, it will. So now we see the flag cleared, it date, time, name stamped that, who did it? <clears throat> did it give you an option to do, put a note in there why the flag was cleared? You would do that separately as a note. So like um, if I, so in this case, we contact the store, we'll do this after close tonight. Maybe I wanted to add a note about that. Then I could, then I could add a note. So maybe I called um, location to confirm they were okay with scheduling with the vendor and they said yes. So I might put a note in and then cleared the flag. Okay, got you. If I wanted to communicate back to the vendor, then I would use message. So now I can send a message. When I do message, it automatically defaults to whoever the work order is assigned to. If I wanted to send something about this work order to another email address, then I have that option. So I can send it to anyone. So as the rep working this, if I need help from my service manager, I could send them an email and it'll attach um, you know, this work, this work order number. If I wanted to send the vendor a message, <coughs> I can do that through the system. And so now the vendor will get an email and they'll get a flag on their work order in their system. So then the vendor basically is gonna go out and perform the work. So here you can see, I got a message. So I said, thanks for the update. So as the vendor, I also have a flag I can come in and clear. It also as the vendor sent me an email. So now I've got this scheduled. So as the vendor, I would just um, be waiting until I completed the job to I'm either going to need to submit a quote if I need to exceed the NTE, or I'll complete the job for under the NTE, attach all my pictures and complete the work order out. So before I do that, let's go back to our work order list. And let's pull up one of these other work orders that we created. Okay, so this one we can see hasn't been assigned yet. So now we're gonna assign this to a not connected vendor so we can see the difference in the process. So if I choose to assign this to a not connected vendor, okay, so here's my ABC company who's not connected. So I still have a send option, okay? So once I have, um, so all of these vendors that are set up, even if they're not um, connected, we would still be able to have the system send them an email if we have an email address for the vendor in their record. So if for some reason we weren't able to get that, then we, you might have to um, get that information. So I just clicked on the vendor name, so it brought me up to the quick view so I could see their phone number. Um, I think I forgot to show you how you could actually call the vendor. So I could get their phone number and email address, see any work orders that they have assigned to them. So I would still do this. Can I have a quick yeah, go ahead. About um, so I was on our main site today. The address of connected vendors is available, but the addresses for non-connected and um, not approved vendors does not show up. Is there a way to get those to display? Um, you mean an actual physical address? Show, yes. Or do they show once they're connected? They would show once they're connected. Okay, is there a way to get the non-connected one to be displayed with their address? Just to make sure they're in the, you know, the right area or closest one. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, we can, we only have a space to store their zip code and service radius, if we know that. On the non-connected providers. So once they connect, their full we'll address speak? information will show up. So if we know what their zip code is, we could put that in there. Okay, so there's no way to add a field for the street address too, so we have their principal address? There is not, unless you wanted to add that into the organization record. So attached to each vendor is also um, an organization, which I don't think they're not, um, I don't think I set them up in the stage site because, but we are using them. They will be set up in the live site. The organization record gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, I think we can store an address in there. Yes, so here's the address. So if you wanted to, you'd have to store it in the organization record if you wanted to add a street address. I know. Um, okay, back to the work order. ABC company. Okay, so we'd still have done the same thing, right? Called them, spoken to them. They're going to take the work order. And so we can add a note to that effect. But we still want to send the work order. So here's the email address pulled from the vendor record. If we needed, if we got a different email address to send them to send this to, then we could do that. It still pulls in that message, but there's also a form that goes over when we send to a non-connected vendor. And we have selected that that pre that form is pre-selected. It's global, which form we can send. So it has details. So here's that email to the non-connected provider. So this is a work order form that we created. It's a custom form that shows all the details of this work order, some terms and things like that. So this goes out to non-connected providers when we send it to them. Now the difference with a non-connected provider is that they're not going to have control to change the status of your work order. And so once we spoke to them and got confirmation that they're going to do to do the work, then I would actually be performing the pickup. And so when I go to do that, it's going to tell me, hey, you're not ABC company. Are you sure you want to do this? And I'm going to say right. yes. I can also put in notes. So here I could put in notes that when I spoke to Joe, they said they would do this. And so then I can pick that up. And so now the status is going to be changed from new to open. And so now this might be where to do's come in really handy because there's not the vendor when they go out and complete the job. I mean, they might email us with some pictures, but I might want to do some follow up on this before that happens, right? So this might be a good place on your non-connected work orders to set up some to-dos on what I want to follow up on. I also would have wanted to come in here and update the NTE to whatever I talked to them about. So my bad for not showing you guys that again. All right, so then I could add to-dos. So then once this vendor confirms that they have done the job, then we're going to go through the completion process. What I'm going to do, I'm going to flip over here really quick. 
and complete this work order as the vendor. So the vendor is going to complete the work order, type in what they did, and then they'll be submitting an invoice for the work. They'll also be able to add attachments. My computer hates me. Um, all right. So they can come in and they'd be able to attach all of their pictures that they want to attach. So I'm just going to – it's really going to be a pipe, but I'm going to call it broken tile. So I add as many attachments as I want. And then you guys are going to see those on your service request. So that work order is going to fall off of the, the dashboard because it's no longer going to be active, but the status will have changed to completed. So if I come back in here, I'm going to see it's been completed. My notes repaired three tiles near the doorway. Here's an attachment. So if I want to view that, I can view it. Should open up in a separate window. There we go. So at this point, the work order has been completed. So all I'm doing on, on, in this case is now I'm going to contact the location to make sure they were satisfied with the repairs. Right. So now this section, completion and verification. Here is where the actual repairs that were done. <clears throat> show up. And so, and so now I'm going to contact the lo this customer location to make sure that the work was done and they were satisfied. And when I speak with them, I'm going to come in here and perform this verification rating. So I'm not sure how we have four ratings, negative, neutral, not completed, or positive. These ratings um, eventually calculate for the vendor, and so they become part of the vendor score on the network in your system. So I don't know if you guys will actually ask the location what rating you would give them and then select that, or if based on your conversation you guys would rate it. That's up to you. If, um, if we have someone connected and using the customer portal and we have it turned on, customers would be able to perform this function themselves if we, if we chose to enable that in the future. So as the service rep, I'm going to come in, talk, I'm going to talk to the customer. They're going to say that they had a great experience. We're going to type in their name. So. Um, Right here. What's the difference? Okay, so I type in my notes, and so then this verification value will be will be done, and it's going to be important to put the name of the person you spoke with at the site, because um, I believe you guys have a verification form that's going to pull that information into there. And I think the accounting team uses that form. So at this point. We're done. We're just waiting now for the invoice to come in from the vendor. And so those are separate processes. So questions about a connected vendor, using a connected vendor? No, nope, I think we're good. I also had set a to-do, so I'm going to mark that to do as completed because we followed up on the completion. All right, so then with this non-connected work order to a non-connected vendor, I'm going to have to do the follow-up. So if I get an email back from ABC company telling me that the job has been done and maybe it has the attachment of all the pictures, then I'm going to go, I'm going to need to find the work order. And so just as 
an option. You know, we have um, search as an option here in my filters. So if the vendor emails me back, if they're giving me the work order number, I would be able to copy and paste or type that work order number in so I get right to the work order. I don't have to go trying to find it from my dashboard or some list of hundreds of work orders. If I know the work order number, I can type it in. So when the vendor confirms to me that they have completed the work, then I'm gonna need to be the one who comes in and completes this work order. So marks it as complete. So I might be coming in here with adding a note You know, received email from ABC that work was done. And then I would come in to actually mark the work order complete. So again, I get a, a warning, hey, you're not ABC company, do you really wanna do this? Yes, in their email, they hopefully told me what they did to make the repairs. So I would type those in and then I would, I don't, it looks like we made this mandatory, but I don't think we have that mandatory in the, um, Would we put our notes in there if we talk to the store or would that still be in a separate field? The verification is still a separate field. So this is just Got completion it. and th this is the completion note. So the repairs that were made. So it looks like I don't have to fill in repair category code. Okay, so then I've marked the work order as completed. So you could absolutely um, contact the, lo the store location and you could theoretically do the verification before the work order is marked as completed. But to take all the right. logical steps, the verification happens once the work order is marked as completed. So then I would come in here after I've completed the work order and I'd be able to do the verification. So there's where my notes go. So then I could come in here, contact the location. And there we go. And so now we're waiting for an invoice to come in. And so that would kick off the finance process. Question, crazy question. <clears throat> the on-site buy time and the acknowledged buy is turned red. Any way to, to clear that up other than to keep increasing it? Um, no. Turns red once it passes the date. Right. And how do... Here are my thoughts. I'm thinking when once the vendor acknowledges it or he, he's on site by that time it is it it's been staying red and uh wanted to see how you clear that up oh so notice this is because it um i don't think we would see that on any on your on some of your other work orders so i think um it's because it had already passed so like we're gonna see it on this one that we had created, it's already passed those dates by the time that the pickup happened. Okay. So if the pickup happened before this acknowledged by time, then it would not turn red. So the red is indicating that these things were done past, these, these actions were taken past the time that they were expected. That's why they're red. Can you change the due by date if the work order has not been completed yet? You can. Yeah, you would just come in here to edit the schedule. So this one, you know, we didn't get to in time or we were following up with the customer and so we have to reset it. So we can absolutely come in and say, okay, we need this Friday and um, 
I'm going to change this to tomorrow and I need them to acknowledge this tonight. So I could definitely come in and make these changes. You want to be so you want to be careful about making changes to your due by dates, um, you know, depending on this the situation, right? Because you do want to be able to see if you're meeting your what you've set up as your SLAs for a different priority of work orders. And so if you're always changing them, you're obviously going to be missing a metric. But if it makes sense to change them, then you absolutely should. So if you told, so we tell this, well, let's say we send this to a vendor, we told them it's due by Friday afternoon, but they have contacted us, told us they need to order a part, we've approved them to order that part, and they told us it's not going to be here till next Wednesday, then that's absolutely appropriate for us to adjust the due by date. So they're not going to get penalized for doing their job. Okay, are there other questions about non are there questions about working with the non connected vendor work orders? And I'll let you go the year. I'm good, Kristen, but I've I've seen a lot of this. Um I don't know if anybody else has wants to see something. Brandon, you good? This is fine, I mean fine I can do I'm sorry, what, what was the question? The question about a vendor, since they're not connected, they're not in the system. If I've got to go to Google and find a new vendor in the area, how do I add them into the system? We don't email it tomorrow and she does it. Yeah, uh, okay. just like we do now. That's an internal process for us, Kristen. Okay. Take care of it. Kristen, can you go through the um, quote process from the vendor? Um, yes. Yeah. No, we need to. Oh. It's on shorted waters right now. Well, no, just for the, the connected vendor. Mm. It can be. All right, so when we, so here's the work order. Okay, so we're going to request a quote from this vendor. So I'm going to assign it. So when we send it, we're going to click on request quote. We probably would have talked to them by this point, right? Or they right. they have told us. So this is when we're sending the work order. If we request a quote, we can send that over. They'll get notified on their end to send the quote to send in a quote. All right. So the vendor then gets the work order. Let's see if it actually went through. Here it is. So you can see as the vendor, I have a flag and I've also got quote requested. So I'm going to need to submit a quote on this. So first I'm accepting the work order as the vendor. And then I'm just going to go ahead and clear my flag as the vendor. So then I would go and as the vendor, I'm going to get you a quote. So there's a quote section. They'll come in and put in the total dollar amount and then a description of the work. So we typically tell the vendors that they should break out labor and materials charges um, in their quotes. You might have some vendors, if you're requesting them to submit a special form or something, that they'll do see attachment, and then they'll attach a quote form that will have all the broken out details. So it just depends sometimes on the vendor. Okay, so they'll enter the details. Okay, they enter their quote, they'll submit it. So then that's going to flag the work order. No, I have it. 
Okay, so then it tells them that they're waiting for approval and then it will flag this work order as a quote having been submitted. So I lose my flagged view when I... Uh, Uh, so here I see that it's been, a quote's been submitted. Okay, so then I would be able to come into here, quote submitted, flag, action log. The quote comes into the vendor quote section. I click on view details and I'd be able to view the details of what they've submitted. So it basically gives me whatever description they typed in. If they said see attachment, then I could go in and go to the document section and see the quote attachment. And then basically what I'm going to do is either approve or reject the quote for the vendor. That's, that's real time. Yes. So if I approve the quote, if I click approve, it will um, send the vendor a message that the quote's been approved and it'll automatically set the NTE to the quoted amount. So that's what the vendor can submit. If I reject the quote, then it leaves the NTE alone. It tells the vendor you've rejected their quote and it would give them the ability to either complete the work order um, or submit a new quote or maybe you told them, go ahead and invoice me the hour that you spent. So they'll be able to, and so you'd have to manually set the NTE to pay them for that hour of labor. So that's what would happen with the quotes. If you have a work order that um, is assigned to a non-connected provider, you can enter, let me see if we have another one. You can enter a quote, you can submit the quote, so it will be a part of that quote section if you wanted to. So here's one I'm gonna have go out to my not connected vendor. So if they submitted me a quote, I can actually fill this in so that we'll have a record of it in the quote section. So I can come in and, and copy over the details. Okay, this vendor submitted to me a quote for 1500 and here's the details of what. Or we might say, see quote document. So I can submit it here if I just wanted to be able to keep track of it that way, that will also flag the work order automatically when I put that in as a submitted quote. And then I would still have the option to approve or reject it. Still gonna- How would you click on that? Did you click on the little icon in oh. the quote field? Yep. Excuse me. review yeah. quote. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep, so approve or reject, so Go ahead and mark this approved. So you'll see my vendor NTE increased. What didn't happen because they're not connected is the vendor wasn't notified that their quote was approved. So I would have to tell them that. And so I could come in here and message them. Or since if they send it to me on an email, I can reply back to their email. However, you, if I send a message through here, it at least logs it in the work order.
And if we needed to sign something, if we had attached that quote document, we could attach it back to them with an approval or signature or whatever we needed to do. So I could send them a message this way and that will at least record that I communicated to them that their quote was approved. Other questions? Or anything else, anything that you want to see again? Um, the users, did TIP set up our users here, or did you TIP set those up for the stage? Yeah, I had gotten a list. Oh. I don't know if there's been changes to this list since TIP and I had last loaded it. I think this list in stage is also the same list that was loaded into production. And what would passwords be, or do you reset that those or I believe everyone was set up with first initial last name and then one two three four as the initial password. Okay, perfect. So they can go in and mess with some if they want. Yes. Yeah, and in the live site, if you want to go and change your password, you'd be able to go if you just go up to my profile under the drop down under your name then you'd be able to get an option to change your password. Also, let me show you too that there's a history icon in the top right here. And so this will show me the last work orders I was working on. So it shows me kind of last places that I've, that I've been. So if I was working on something, got interrupted, had to go look at something else and couldn't remember which work order I was looking at, this will show me, oh, it's probably this one. So, and then it'll take me right to that work order. Very good. The search also works here as a work order search. So I did show you going to the work order list and searching, but you can actually, if you're somewhere completely different in the system or you're just coming back and you just have the work order number, if I you know copied and pasted it into here, I can search and that would take me right to that particular work order there from there as well. All right, any other questions, comments, concerns? No, I think we're good. I want to see how the um, estimate to the client looks again. Uh, I think it's changed for you. Can she show that? Yes, yeah, she should show that. Can you show an estimate to the client? Well, we didn't talk about how we were going to what we were gonna do for the setup of that. If we we're gonna to try to use proposals or if we were going to just record them as um, customer estimate here in the estimate section, job estimate. Now let's go through the estimate process first. So, I mean, so there's nothing in the system that is going to help you build an estimate. So it's my understanding you guys take the quote that you got from the vendor, right? And you're going to apply some kind of markup to that and present it as an estimate to the customer, right? You have a form that you create for an estimate? That's right. So we're doc. We add pictures. So that process really isn't isn't going to change. You're going to create that document and then you could attach that document into the system. Uh, so there's no way to do it. If we wanted to do a proposal, if, if things change and we weren't going to do it that way, can we submit a proposal to our customer through here without doing a separate document or anything like that? So you can, but it's not going to give you, um, if your customers don't require any kind of breakdown, then you can. I mean, we could either use proposals or job estimates. Proposals are nice because um, they send an email and there's the opportunity to email 
a reply back, an approval or a rejection back, but they do require some setup. We would have to set up an approval template of who could, um, who can approve those things. So I can use get approval. This is gonna create a proposal on this work order. Get approval for, um, I always usually choose other. You could do request or estimate. Um, the reason I choose other is because these are attached to different functionality that you don't want to bypass your role in. So like if I were to choose vendor quote, then that's going to want to approve the exact quote amount for the vendor. And if the customer were to reply to an email and say approve, then that automatically happens behind the scenes. So you guys don't have any way to interject in that process. But if you use other, it's not tied to anything in the system. So you have full control over being the one to click the approve button on the quote and increase the NTE and, and that kind of thing. So here I could come in and put in my, my proposal amount. If I'm not doing any other documentation, then I really get an amount and a free form description field. So I can certainly copy and paste from someplace else, but I'm not gonna be able, I've heard that when you guys provide estimates, other people in your business have to provide a lot of detail. And so if that's the case, you're not really gonna have a place to do a breakdown of parts, materials, um, labor materials, um, description of the work, those types of things. So if you were still creating that form though, I can come and choose my file and attach it to this proposal. Yeah, hopefully we'll be getting away from the form. That's why we're kind of just wanting to see what it looks like. Uh, because we can just copy and paste what the sub told us here. We can break down materials or break it down however we want to in there as a free form. Yeah. Or copy and paste in there. Um, what's the character limit on that field? Do you have any idea? I want to say 4,000 characters, but I'd have to confirm that. Sweet. <laughs> So okay, the, other, the other setup piece is setting up approval templates. So who would get emailed at the customer to approve this? Now we can set these up internally. So we don't necessarily have to email these out to the customer through the system. But the nice thing about the proposals is that it does that. But then there's some setup of setting up these approval templates. So I just chose, I know we're not on a community loans customer, but this is the only one that we had set up for demo. So the approval template can automatically um, show up here based on the customer or the job record that it's attached to. So when that setup is done, this would automatically default. So once I create the proposal, it adds a section to the work order. Now this is telling me that there's no one on the approver list. The approval list is invalid. So um, I would have to add somebody to the approval list. But if we had those lists set up already, then we wouldn't probably end up in that with that error. So basically this would email out to the approve the proposal to whoever's on the approver list. And they would get that proposal document. They can review it and they'd actually be able to um, approve or reject it right from the email. So here it is. So this went out to the approver. Um, it tells them you can respond with approve or reject. We can customize a little bit about of this message. So here's the amount and the description. And so if I was ready as the approver to approve this, I could just reply back and approve, and then that would update the proposal. So what proposals gives you, it adds a section to the work order. There's also under my dashboard, similar to to to-dos, is proposals. So you can see outstanding proposals. You can also create proposals that are not associated with a work order if you needed to.
So you have to re you have to receive a rejection or an approval on that proposal before the work order can be closed out. Um, I don't know that. So. Send was that and send. Yeah, it looks like your complete option. Oh no, you can still mark the work order as completed without having a proposal approved. You may say there, landlord. We didn't do the work. And you're going to get into the child, and then we're going to still charge an assessment on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if it turned out to be landlord responsibility, we still want to be able to move through. Yeah. Now you could, um, depending on the the role, so we can set up roles so that someone on your team would be able to override or be an approve act as the approver. So say Jason is the customer um, contact that we've set up as the approver. For whatever reason, he has not responded or we got some message and we want to just mark this as rejected. Um, with certain permissions, users on your team can overwrite, can actually make the approvals or the rejections. So that way it wouldn't be sitting out. So it allowed me as the sysadmin who has the ability, the permission to override the proposals to reject it. So, I mean, that's the nice thing about proposals is that you can attach documents to it um, it does have a separate section for tracking. It does notifications to the customers who are the approval contacts, and they can reply back via email. They don't need to have access through your customer portal to interact with those proposals. Um, estimates, if we used the estimate section of the work order, then that would require um, the portal for your customer to actually take an approve or reject action themselves. Um, and it also, the messages that go out on those are more like alert notifications. So not necessarily the details of the, the estimate. So I, I would recommend using proposals. It will require some setup to be done. <laughs> we can. I'm brain dead at this point. <laughs> we got a lot to backtrack on to show what we need to do different with certain things. All right, Kristen. We're good for now. No other questions? I think so. Uh, no, we'll handle any other questions offline. Okay. Well, let me know if you need my help with anything before we meet on Monday. Oh, while I have you guys on the phone. Well, let me check. Okay, so Monday, our meeting time. I think it's going to show an hour earlier on your calendars because of the time change on Sunday. Okay. So it's going to move to 2 p.m. Eastern. Are you guys okay with that, or do you want me to move it back an hour so it'll still be up Eastern? No, that's okay. That's good. Okay. I just wanted to point that out because sometimes the time change, when I create meetings, my time doesn't change, but the meeting's going to be at a different time, your time, so I want to make sure that that's okay. So. Sure. That should be okay, but if it's not, I'll let you, we'll let you know. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I will... Yeah.